right, Tom, welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Austin LaRoche, who is in Pasadena, just up the road in LA area. How are you doing, Austin? Good, John. How about yourself? Yeah, doing great. And Austin is the CEO of Attack Interactive, creators of the M2S marketing to sales framework, a B2B growth system that synchronizes strategy and execution into a pragmatic plan. And that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, your company model is strength and structure, where teams, uh, where he and his team watch the clients go from random acts of marketing into an organized operation and optimize for success. So, um, Austin, let's just take a step back for a moment and tell me where your framework came from and why you felt you needed a framework for, for the work you do. Oh, uh, you know, in our line of work, everything tends to be custom, right? Mm -hmm. Unique companies, unique problems, need unique solutions. So everybody's trying to throw darts at marketing to hit those. And I feel like there's a lot of good ideas but they're not going through the right process. They're not looking through the right lens. So I can't tell you the amount of times people have come to me and said, hey, you seen this new shiny new toy, mm -hmm. this new social media platform, Meerkat? We gotta get on there now, we gotta do this tomorrow. And I'm like, well, why? You're a manufacturing company. Like who wants to, you know, what? where does this work in your, buyer's journey. like, And it's like, well, no, we got to do it. There's this demand for marketing as something's new and shiny that we got to do it without understanding why. And so yeah. I really wanted to, to bring purpose to marketing, right? I wanted to make sure that every step along the way, you knew what you were doing, why you were doing it, who was in charge, and the numbers you needed to hit to make it impactful. Right. Because, um, I mean, let's face it, uh, I think you're 100% correct. And I think it's getting worse, actually because there's more shiny new toys out there. And, you know, the platforms, um, there's more platforms. And I think people, as you write, I think people get so overwhelmed and they focus on the platform or the tool instead of instead of where their audience are. It always seems to me, and, and I'd like to get your, your thoughts on this, Austin, is that people just shy away from really understanding their buyers. I mean, they kind of do, but they don't really want to do the in-depth research to really figure out where they are they kind of prefer to operate at a kind of a little more of a vague level i think it's more comforting absolutely and part of our framework is really being able to build out those buyer personas and really understanding who these people are what it is they're after all of their pain points and hesitations as well as the tendencies of how you need to approach them and then you know as, as well as you know <laughs> uh, your plan of action to be able to attract, convert, close, and delight each persona. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, it starts at, it starts at the very beginning. Um, and I presume your process, that's where your process starts as well. Your process starts with the whole, the, the whole purpose about what you're doing and why. And again, like you mentioned at the beginning, I think that's something that people um, skip over or do a kind of poor job of because, I don't know, we're wired to get to execution, right? We want to be in people, and most people are tactical rather than strategic, right? So they want to get down into the weeds immediately. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's people who want you just to work, 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 you know, maybe A-B test a couple things without even thinking about like, why are we doing this? And what is the outcome that we're looking for, right? I, I think you start with a foundation where you really have to understand four things. One, your vision. Like mm -hmm. I, it's crazy to me, the amount of people who don't understand the vision of their company service or product. All right. And the next is just branding and communication. I don't mean like crazy branding. Like I, it, it right. just needs right. to be a, a message, you know, your value propositions, you know, who you are and why anyone should care. Right. Um, and then you should definitely know that audience as well, really break down who they all are and then really dive into the data. Mm hmm. So I think that's I think that's a big I think that's a big part of it then too also is uh, as you said I mean I totally agree with you on the vision I mean you need to really understand where you're headed your brand your audience 
uh, but we live in this uh, we live in this era of data overload, right? And more and more. And I think people have and and there was all people talk about big data and all this. And the reality is the data that you need is very specific and you need to understand what that data is and focus on gathering that and analyzing that rather than just grabbing loads of different pieces of information. Because if you just grab data from everywhere, you're just going to cherry pick anyway at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, you can make a lot of stories up with statistics, right? Yeah, yeah. So one of my favorite ways of, of being able to really focus on the right data uh, is actually just comes from EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System and their basic scorecard model, where you really look at what seven to 13 metrics really matter in either a division or a company. And from mm -hmm. there, you set a weekly goal for them and you just look at your numbers week after week because then you're focusing on the right data, you're simplifying it all, and you're seeing right there if it's working or not. And so you make data-driven decisions before the data kind of goes the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I think that's one of the failings is just understanding uh, and identifying metrics and then tracking them properly and agreeing what those simple metrics are. Uh, but once you get into the next part of, of your process, uh, Austin, uh, I mean, this is where you get in really into the strategic planning part of it. Can you just explain to people what, what is strategic planning? Um, because sometimes people think this is an overblown, like it's a big fancy thing, but really it's, it's just identifying where you want to get to and how you think you're going to get there. Yes, I mean, strategic planning is different for a lot of people. I know people who strategically plan things for three years that never come to fruition. Yeah. Uh, the part of my framework is really condensing strategic planning. And mm -hmm. it's taking each of your buyer personas and identifying how are we going to attract the prospect, convert the prospect into an opportunity, close the opportunity into a customer, and delight the customer. Mm -hmm. And in each of those buckets, what tactics are we taking? What KPIs need to be measured based on those tactics? What's our creative approach or our message? Who's responsible? And then we identify if there's any obstacles, right? You know, oh, we want to, you know, launch a new uh, paid campaign. Well, we have an obstacle. We don't have any creative built whatsoever, right? So mm -hmm. we identify all of those things. But step two is where we really identify granularly what needs to happen at each stage for each buyer persona. And that also occurs on marketing and sales, right? Right. You know, and bringing those two together so they're playing with one another. Yeah, no, I think that's important. I think anybody who has a strategic plan that's two years and it still hasn't gone anywhere, I think that's strategic procrastination. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, but but back to uh, back to your point there about the sales and marketing. I think this is probably the critical piece here because until sales and marketing have some kind of joint ownership over things and they have joint accountability and realize that the world we live in today, it, the demarcations are so much more blurred than they ever were. So that piece, that that bringing bringing sales into it and, and marketing together at this point, it's so critical because often it's done too late. Yeah, I'm actually really optimistic about the silos that I feel like have broken down a little bit uh, with marketing and sales. Uh, and I think two things have really shifted. I feel like marketing and sales both really um, uh, are responsible for revenue. So, mm -hmm. you know, having the, you know your chief revenue officer be in charge of your VP of sales and your VP of marketing kind of makes everybody have to play in the same sandbox. And similarly, I think the CRM and marketing automation technology is so great that everybody can be really understanding where their prospects are, the messages that they're getting, and they can see that inside the same systems. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, and you're right, and I think the technology has helped with the collaboration piece, uh, you know, today. And it's, and so I think sales and marketing are playing, because like if you're in, say you're inside the pipeline or CRM, you're a salesperson, you want to send some marketing emails, the marketing person go in and create the templates for you, set it all up and everything, and all you got to do is fire it off. That's really good collaboration. And I think that's, I think you're right. I think the technologies are also driving the collaboration. Yeah, ab absolutely. And obviously, Pipeliner is a, a big part of that. Yeah, because um, let's talk a little bit about when you get into when you get into the impl implementation phase of it, because now you want to really be process driven, right? 
Yeah. So this implementation phase, I always talk about it as, as closing a gap. Okay. Because mm -hmm. you create a strategy, right? You identify all these ways that you're going to attract, convert, close, and delight all of your target market, and you're really excited by it. But when you add up those obstacles that you have to identify, you realize there's a gap that you have between executing this strategy and building the strategy. And typically, four things are coming from the implementation phase. You need technology, mm -hmm. resources, content, <laughs> and processes. These right. four things typically need to be built out so that you can actually do what it is you want to do. And so in an ideal world, you don't want your implementation phase to be too long, right? Because then you're getting your eye off the ball of what the strategy mm -hmm. is to begin with. And so that's part of what you have to understand when building that strategy is how can we make an implementation phase that's, you know, let's say three to maybe six months, but much closer to those three months. Right. Uh, and then that way, you know, we can fill in all those gaps. We can start utilizing the right technology. We build out all of the content. We bring in the right resources that we need to fulfill uh, the strategy. And then we make sure that everybody has the right processes so we can streamline what we're doing as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. Yeah. And and let's face it, the uh, the issues that normally come up at the implementation phase are maybe when things weren't defined properly originally, when people are kind of unclear as to what's expected of them, um, if the KPIs haven't been properly identified. There's a lot of things that can derail an implementation if you don't have these things in place, which, you know, obviously that's part of your process to make sure you have these things in place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't want to say that project creep is inevitable, but mm -hmm. I think if you really have implementation, like uh, a point where you're really focused on a deadline and almost like a, a what's called an MVI, a, a minimal viable implementation, yeah. um, you don't have to have absolutely all the bells and whistles, but you need to have everything in place so that you can at least start hitting the ground running. And if you look at it through that lens, I think you can avoid some of that scope creep. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's hard. It's hard, but uh, I think you can. Yeah, because obviously one of the things that you have to balance today is uh, the fact that the world is moving at a very fast pace and people are very distracted and they're getting pinged with things all over the place. So you need to move at a decent level of pace. You know, you need to get things out there, but you also then need to make sure that, you know, as we said, the, you know, the process is properly in place. So balancing the two of those is quite uh, is quite a tricky one. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, we take a lot of those principles from from EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system, and mm -hmm. try and break everything down and organize weekly meetings, understanding exactly what action items that we have. You know, um, when more uh, higher development, um, we typically utilize the sprint process. So uh, whatever your process is, as long as you you know you have clear expectations and clear accountability. I think you can get where you're wanting to go. It's just really making sure that those things are identified. And then if they are off track, people are being held accountable to get things moving uh, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So where, where are you seeing, uh, talk me through a couple of maybe examples of success that you've seen with customers. I don't need the names, just the just what you did with them and how you helped them uh, through this process, like be more successful. Yeah, uh, I'm currently uh, uh, working with a company out of uh, Boston that does a lot in the in, um, environmental uh, services. And they're one of these companies, and they're my, my favorite kind of companies to work with, where everything that they're doing offline and the actual product is wonderful. But being able to articulate that uh, has been really difficult. And being able to talk about why they're different has been really mm -hmm. difficult. And then being able to make sure that the uh, what it is they're wanting people to understand about them is portrayed in their style and uh, in, in the way that they show up uh, online and uh, even, you know, uh, on the job in person. So uh, I flew out uh, with them uh, months uh, and months ago, and we started going through the entire example, really building out their personas. They work in a lot of different segments, uh, academia, life sciences, uh, and all of that, we really started figuring out who this buyer was. And then we were looking at a lot of campaigns that had currently been running both organically as well as paid search and really starting to tighten those up. Uh, they also use uh, a, a lot of different systems for both um, automation, their CMS, uh, as well as their CRM. And so making sure that all of that data was aligned and we were able to 
automate as many processes as somebody would go through this sales cycle was a really big part of, of what they needed to do. And once we got that technology right, and once we got the messaging right, we've already seen you know, a 20% uh, uptick in, mm-hmm. uh, in leads and conversions. And so we're, uh, we're really, really excited uh, at the work there. We're just past that implementation phase and we're really hitting that uh, uh, strategy and executing it uh, week over week. Fantastic. One of the things you referred to there, I just wanted to come back to from my notes, is is differentiation, right? And that is the toughest thing today because, apart from a few um, obvious examples, there's a lot of a lot of services and products out there today that people just perceive as being commoditized, right? It doesn't really matter. And and especially when you have a lot of online business subscriptions, I mean, people just switch, you know, they don't care. So that idea of, of differentiation and then retention those are two very very difficult pieces and the things that's undermining a lot of a lot of businesses today yeah and i think sometimes that happens with the gap between um sales and service right Mm -hmm. sales promises the world they get the deal and then maybe service can't keep up with some of the promises that were made um and i really do feel like that that customer success is a vital part of any business and so once Mm -hmm. the sales been made having the right people uh, in the customer success seat to really help uh, reduce that churn is really important because if you get people to, to fall in love with your product, uh, if you really focus on that delight the customer phase, you know, mm-hmm. then they, they go from people who are considering leaving to you know, your biggest evangelists. They're the ones who are telling all of their friends and colleagues and network, hey, you've got to go on this system because not only is it a great system to be on, but like they are such mm-hmm. a delight to work with. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And and that's the thing is, I think sometimes uh, I'm sure you've had this experience where what really different, what really makes the company different is not something that's obvious to them. They think it's something different. But but when it comes down to when you can identify it, have you had uh, experiences where it's been kind of surprising to the customer how you think they should really um, project themselves? Yeah, actually. Um, and I'll tell you where it really, where we can really unlock that is when you're really looking at that buyer and I mm-hmm. like to focus on two different things. One pain points, obviously, you know, because that, that's why they're there, but then two customer hesitation. What is their hesitation? Why, why would they not go with you? Even if price isn't an op, isn't, isn't a problem. Like what are those, why are they upset with their current system? And why wouldn't they go with you if you're the right choice for them? And that really helps build the right messaging mm-hmm. to be able to help overcome those customer hesitations and to be able to differentiate uh, in a way that makes people recognize like this is going to make your life better. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. I've always I always think that role playing is such a good thing to do and putting yourself in the shoes of the customer. We don't do that often enough, I don't think. But there's a great example of what you just said is like putting yourself in the shoes and then saying, like, how how would we receive this? Yeah, absolutely. I, I really feel like the more that you can uh, really think about who that customer is and why, why even if that you were the perfect, perfect service or product for them, they wouldn't buy it with you. Uh, mm-hmm that is a, a great lens to be able to persuade them to do what you you know is in their best interest. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, listen, um, Austin, this has been fantastic. All of Austin's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell us a little bit more about you and your company. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we're uh, Attack Interactive, and we are a uh, full-service agency formerly out of uh, downtown Los Angeles. We were much like many people when the pandemic hit. We uh, The talent base uh, spread across the country, and now we're uh, mm-hmm. fully remote. Uh, but we, uh, we definitely specialize in all things strategy, marketing, development, design, and then marketing technology and making all the systems uh, talk to each other and, and work with one another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's probably it, it probably works well having a remote company because having a company in L.A., you know, you could have somebody who lives five miles away, but it takes two days to get there through the traffic. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, man. Don't miss those commutes. I'm sure you don't. Well, listen, Austin, thanks again. This has been great. Thank you for watching and listening. And as I said, all of Austin's information is below this video. So please go check out Attack uh, and Check Interactive. And, and Austin's work, and I'll see you all soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for your time, John. Yeah, no worries. Bye-bye.